My name is Sabrina Klein. I'm a volunteer and a board consultant with the MAC, the Middletown Arts Center. We're collaborating with Andre's Lounge and I'm working with Clovis Lewis to produce this series. This is the last of the series. You met Barbara Cook, our treasurer, as you came in the door. She's also the executive director of the Lake County Arts Council. And our other staff, Laura, is back there saying hi to everybody. Ami's there on the boards. He's He's sending this all out to the Zoom audience. So if we can keep ambient noise down, the Zoom audience will hear us better. But it's hard when you're in a bar having fun. And especially here at Andre's Bar. This is my first time here, and I'm loving the space and all of the regulars I've met. Thank you for being here. We're excited. I would like to begin after I've welcomed you, as I just did and introduce myself. Oh, I forgot, one more staff member, I'm sorry, Almendra Garcia, she's back there in the back. And Thomas, from Peg TV. I don't know your last name, Thomas. DeWalt. DeWalt? Yeah. Thomas, now I know it. Thomas, Thomas has um, been uh, filming all of these conversations for us and with us, so he's part of the team, so thank you so much for being here. I want to start by reading an acknowledgement of the land that we st stand on. The Middletown Art Center acknowledges that we operate on the ancestral lands of the people known as Como, Wafo, and Lake Miwok, who comprise the Middletown Rancheria of Como Indians of California. Today, we deliver the sounds of liberation from here in Lakeport, a little different from Middletown, from the ancestral territory of the Eastern Como and Scotts Valley Band of Como Indians. They all have Como in their names, but the diversity of peoples and nations here is quite extraordinary. We stand in solidarity with these first peoples who are the past, present, and future stewards of this land. We recognize the great harm done to them here as well as their resilience. We pledge to continue to build authentic relationships and work together with them through creative action towards healing both the land and the people. We also know this is just but a small step towards reconciliation and acknowledging real history, but we are proud to take it with our partners in Lake County. So thank you for joining us here. Thank you, Andre, for letting us um, have this intimate conversation in your space. We're very excited to be here. Sounds of Liberation was conceived by Clovis Lewis. Clovis, many of you already know, I saw how many people gave him a hug when we came in. <laughs> um, Clovis has a, a, a deep and passionate belief that this is a good time for us to be telling each other our stories. And he has his own reasons for why his story and Andre's stories are of particular interest to us today, right now. This space is for us to hear their stories. I know each of you has a story. And I hope one of these days we get to have a story circle. But I want to make clear that these two men, as much as they've had a platform for music, they haven't really had a public space for sharing their personal stories with people in their community. So this is our purpose here. We invite you to open your ears and open your heart to their story. And we will be around afterwards if anyone cares to share a story, but I do want to let you know, I'm sorry, we won't have time to hear from all of you about your stories, but we will be here afterwards if you'd like to talk with us. I'm going to turn this over to Clovis Lewis right now because Clovis is going to introduce the man of the hour. Thank you so much. For being here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would ask you if you need to speak, please whisper. <laughs> um, I want to thank you all for coming today. This is uh, truly a great, a great uh, pleasure. Uh, I have a few words uh, to say, but first of all, I want to introduce Andre Williams. And then I want to say a few things about him. <laughs> so uh, uh, I have to admit that I lifted this off of your website. <laughs> but I thought it was a really good summation of your career. Okay, So let's see if you agree. Uh, you're an R&B vocalist, songwriter, and producer. Yes. 
uh, you're considered to be a quote pure vocalist because you have a tenor voice that works both with R&B and jazz. Grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area and your love for music began at a very early age, like mine did. I thought I invented rubber bands that make different sounds. Um, you worked with artists like Dorothy Moore, the Pointer Sisters, mm -hmm. and also the Whispers album for your ears only. Right. Okay, but, but, you're best known for how you joined forces to become the lead vocalist for MC Hammer in 1991. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And you were with him on the Too Legit to Quit Worldwide Tour, and you continue to perform with him now? Right. Okay. Uh, so your performance credits with MC Hammer include the Arsenio Hall Show, American Music Awards, Soul Train Music Awards, and the video Bring Our Brothers Home. For veterans. For veterans. Put a pin in that yeah. for a few minutes. Because we're going to get back to that one. So how do I do? Is there anything missing? What? Great. Okay. All right. Um, just for people in the audience and for people looking in online, I want to say a few words about what we're doing here tonight. Okay? Um, Lisa Kaplan, the Middletown Art Center's executive director, and I met following a presentation that I made in the first meeting of a local community action group that was formed following the death of George Floyd. It was called Community Call to Action, a loving response to, system uh, to systemic racism in America. And Lisa approached me to see how I might collaborate with her to address issues of racism using music as a vehicle to raise awareness to the black experience in this primarily white rural region that we're in. I can tell you in, 19, in 2019 I composed a musical set in the 1920s and that deals with systemic racism and I was subsequently incorporating that into research that I was doing uh, in seminary as part of uh, this uh, graduate ministerial program where I was examining African music um, of liberation. And the Middletown Art Center has been working with me to produce this series of interviews and performances of African American musicians. We call this series Sounds of Liberation. And these are interviews and performances that are based on the premise that music by people like Andre and me in large measure, is an expression of the struggle against racism that we've personally experienced. And this is the fourth and final Sounds of Liberation presentation. So, Andre? Yes. <laughs> One thing. <laughs> so, uh, so that, that is the, that is the uh, segue here, and I just want to make sure that, you know, we're going to be, I want to make sure that everyone understands that we're not going to put anybody on the spot in our questioning. Later on, we're, we'll have time for people to, to ask questions. Um, you're not going to be sitting here because you're an expert in anything. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Other than your own experience. All right. All right. And so in the course of our time together, you know, we'll talk and I might be inserting a question or a comment. Um, standing in some ways for the audience uh, as they might wish to engage you. So I want you to be feel comfortable telling me when there's something you don't want to talk about. Um, Do I get a bell or something? Um, <laughs> no, you can just hit me. You can just hit me. So how do you feel about this so far? Good. Okay. Let's go. I have a series of questions. And uh, so first thing, right off, I just have to, I want to ask, how do you identify racially, ethnically, or culturally? How do I identify? Mm -hmm. First, as a human being. Mm -hmm. Yes. And a, uh, um, a brown man. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when did you recognize that you were a brown man? I mean, you were not a brown man at the time, I'd imagine. Yeah. But no, I when did you when did you first like 
feel, oh, there's something I'm, I'm defined as a racial, in, in racial terms? Hmm, I have to say, well, first of all, I was born very light. Mm -hmm. I didn't look so brown when I was born. I was one to two years old, and then things changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll have to show you a picture one day, my baby picture. <laughs> but um, uh, I really noticed it when I started uh, visiting Lake County mm -hmm. at probably uh, five or six years, no, maybe seven. Mm -hmm. Seven years old is when I started coming here. And me and a cousin, we used to walk down Lakeshore Drive and we'd hear some choice words mm -hmm. from the back of a truck. You know, a bunch of kids in the back of the truck, you know. And um, uh, that was the first time I had ever heard anything like that out loud being yelled at me. Mm -hmm. um, being from born in San Francisco and being from San Francisco, I didn't, you know, it was much of that because everybody was everybody, mm -hmm. you know. Black, white, green, blue, you know, you had a variety of colors there, so no one could discriminate. Mm -hmm. But being, him and I being the only ones on the block or mm -hmm. on the strip at that time, mm -hmm. you know, you're gonna get, you, you're gonna get it sooner or later. Is this uh, 50s, 60s? 60s. It's in the 60s. Yes, yeah, stop, yeah. Stop. I, I remember when I was growing up, uh, my father was in the Air Force, and I lived in, um, what we could call the uh, a bubble, uh, like you. I, I didn't, in the Air Force, which was actually at that time, a, wanted to be an anti-racist kind of a society. Uh, the military was very, very keen on creating an environment where they could sort of lead, lead into the future and, and show how a, um, how America could be, yeah. um, but it was uh, it w as soon as I got off base, <laughs> it was uh, I was in a different world, and and I remember this feeling of finding myself realizing that there was I thought maybe there's something wrong with me, you know people were saying bad things to me, and I and I thought oh it's because of the color of my skin, and I don't know about other other people, but I remember I'd take a bath and I'd like. I wonder if I could rub this off. <laughs> you know, and you're talking about being lighter. Yeah. And then um, as you grew, you see what the implications of that right. of that were. So you you were in San Francisco, but you had you came up here a lot? Yeah, I came up here a lot because I was the youngest in the family and my parents wasn't gonna let me just hang out in the city. <laughs> <laughs> and big trouble, you know, the city, and everything's going on, you know? uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I appreciate that, because mm -hmm. I, I, it could have been the other way around. Mm -hmm. So I spent a lot of time up here with my parents. I had to come up on vacations, mm -hmm. come up for the weekend. Mm -hmm. I got tired of hanging out with old people. <laughs> so I, 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 so I, I finally got a, a friend to, to start coming up with me, but you know, you can only skip so many rocks and red but you know, mm -hmm. so I, I was getting bored and I was throwing rocks at trees. I yeah. have a pretty good picture. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I throw a ball now, you know. Spent a lot of time alone throwing rocks. Mm -hmm. What did you what did you um, you know, I was talking about how when I got off the Air Force base I was subjected to a lot of the kinds of racial slurs and things that you yeah. you would experience too. And I remember um, what it was. A it was confusing for me because the the messages I had as a child were different uh, on the air on the Air Force bases than were out outside of the Air Force bases. Yeah. What What would you? How would you describe the the messages that you got? Um, being growing up in San Francisco. Well, growing up in San Francisco, my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. was uh, prominently black you know I had uh, I had white friends mm -hmm. black friends Chinese mm -hmm. you know Filipinos mm -hmm. you know Philippines that's it yeah, yeah. Filipinos mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and, and there was a variety of people there mm -hmm. um, I, I never in being in Clear Lake you know my parents had white friends and mm -hmm. different, so I, I never I never felt like that about anyone you know all I know is love everybody. Mm -hmm. 
the only time I, well, I, I, I'm, it's just kind of funny here. I went to an all black church. Mm -hmm. So for a long time, I mean a long time, I, I didn't think white people went to church. Yeah. <laughs> 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 And then my other thought growing up, I said, white people don't have birthdays. Yeah. <laughs> like, no, really, it wasn't at my birthday party. So I didn't think, I mean, you know, they don't, they're not at church with us. Yeah, they okay, they're not at my birthday party. So maybe they don't have birthdays. You know, you know? You know that, that reminds me when, when um, uh, because we were in the Air Force, we would travel from one place to another. Uh, and uh, often, we would be in the deep south. We'd be traveling one place or another. And, I, and I, I could read at the time, and I remember my parents were looking. I, I, I would look, and I'd see like these uh, signs for coloreds, uh, for whites. And I asked my parents, what is that? Why, why are there so many signs for coloreds and whites? And my parents said, well, that's where they do laundry. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I grew up thinking, these people in the South, they're the cleanest people in the world. <laughs> they, 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 they wash things everywhere. <laughs> so, so not, you know, not going to church. You yeah. Know, yeah, that, that is the, um, did, did your parents, I mean, like in that situation, my parents didn't actually tell us what was going on mm -hmm. um, with, uh, uh, did your parents talk about race as no. a, Thing? No, yeah. they taught me to love, no matter yeah. who it was, no race, no color. Yeah, that's why I didn't know, you know. It, yeah, I had yeah. the same experience. Yeah. Being being in the Air Force is like, well, you know, everybody was in this bubble, like I said, in this right. society. Right. And when you go off base, it's a, a sometimes a different thing. So your off base was coming up here. Yeah, in, in some way. My off base. <laughs> yeah, but um, uh, so church, that was. A uh, place where you saw a lot of uh, saw most of the black people. Yeah, yeah. And Baptist Church in San Francisco. What was the experience for you musically? Uh, as far as what? As far as music and religion, how did that work for you? I love. I've always loved music, and I, I've always listened to a variety of artists. Mm -hmm. So there was no color in music mm -hmm. except for the colors you play mm -hmm. and and so that's that's what I dealt with musically later after Hammer took me to some southern states where I'd never been oh wait a minute you know this is like in the 90s you're talking about this was in the 90s okay what happened really late see you were mm -hmm. talking about earlier with yeah. the color thing uh -huh. you know? but we were in Birmingham and I didn't know I didn't go to still like that, mm -hmm. you know. I've heard about it, you know. I've seen things on television or something, but you know, it's like this is TV. It's not real. Nobody's that crazy, <laughs> you know. But I went there, and uh, 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 what do you call the guys with the round hats? Uh, not a sheriff. It's uh, uh, no. We're gonna play the TV show. Round hat, glasses, dark oh, glasses, oh. gun. I don't know. You know, no. Um, McLeod. Uh, no, oh, in the south. Oh, they got they got sheriffs in the south. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like a ranger state or something. Like, yeah, state trooper. Troopers. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, 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 troopers. Yeah, troopers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Troopers. Yeah. Pulled the buses off. We had ten tour buses mm -hmm. and ten forty foot rigs. Mm -hmm. But the buses were last to get to the show because we were coming from a, another, you know, maybe four hours down the road, and they pulled the buses over and asked. Whose show is this? Who's running this show? We said, the bus in the front, you know? So he went to Hammer's bus and said, is this your show? He said, yes. He said, you do your show and get these people out of my city. Mm -hmm. I said, whoa, and he came back and let us know, hey, we're gonna do the show. We're not staying here tonight. We're gonna leave after the show. Because we had hotels and everything everything booked already you know mm -hmm. so uh that was the first time i, I felt and heard that face to face mm -hmm. where someone don't like you because of the color of your skin mm -hmm. you know and that was the most ridiculous thing 
And later, no, earlier that day, after sound check, we were trying to find them all, like we always do, get some fresh whatever. And uh, the taxi driver, he was driving. I, I told my the dancer, I said, hey, that guy, close your eyes, just listen to his voice. <laughs> Don't look at him. Mm -hmm. Listen to his voice, and then look at the picture. So he listened to his voice, he said, I said, you sound like a black guy. <laughs> <laughs> And, and he was explaining to us, yeah, because I was here and I was in, I had a job here and there. And if they knew I was a, I wouldn't have this job. I told you he was black. But he looked like a white guy. You couldn't, you couldn't tell by looking at him. But when I heard his voice yeah. and a couple of features I looked at on his, his picture up front, I said, man, this guy, he sounds like a black guy. I, because my father was stationed uh, more in the South, Texas, yeah. Alabama, different places. Um, I, uh, you, you're talking about that. I, I remember once uh, when I was younger, I did a lot of speech contests. Mm -hmm. And at the time in Mississippi, this was about 1972. So it must have been 72. Um, in Mississippi, what they did was they would record kids like me doing our speeches because the idea <laughs> was that they'd be able to tell the black kids and <laughs> they wanted to seem uh, more open-minded. Mm -hmm. And I got there and I did my speech and s apparently they couldn't tell that I was black. <laughs> <laughs> And I won for the state of, of Mississippi, the uh, Veterans of Foreign War speech contest. And so, so here I was. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, and the speech was on brotherhood, by the way. Um, but uh, the, the funny thing was is that um, I, they, there were there were men. They were, they were all men. Veterans of Foreign War who were mortified that I was there because I actually showed up. And, and they said, well, this thing isn't working anymore. <laughs> so, so they couldn't tell by my voice. Yeah. Um, but, um, but that's an interesting thing. There's well, they can tell by mine. <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure. That's why I have this place now, because yeah. I couldn't find a job. You know? Um, they can tell by mine. The, this, but, place. Yeah, say, this place. This place, what do you mean? This place. But, I get things done sometimes because I can't do imitations of different things. Uh, you know, uh, right? mm -hmm. I've used it quite often. Yeah, yeah. we call it, yeah. This, uh, I have a country voice. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah you guys have me to drop yeah. down there? <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the voice is a powerful thing. But I've also had black people that I talk to on the phone, mm -hmm. and they ask me and my wife, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. It was, it was a girl that I was, you know, like, <laughs> hey, yeah. oh, you're a white man. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I can be. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, but it, it, I think that that's a really interesting thing. Um, one of the things that people don't talk about is black on black um, uh, prejudice. Uh, like, I, I remember um, in the South, it was where, where I was, it was like, if you were lighter, that was better. You have uh, fair skin or, you know, hair, and that kind of thing. And um, in the research that I did for Harlem Voices, I found uh, this, this thing that they did was, that was called, at the time in Harlem in the 20s, uh, brown, brown paper bagging. You ever heard of that? No. Yeah. Um, and the idea was that if you were if you were darker than a brown paper bag, then you couldn't go to this party or or, or whatever. This is this is the kind of prejudice that comes from living in in right. a society that is really race race and color oriented. Yeah. I don't know if you've heard about that or not. Never heard about that. Yeah. I, I, I know I wouldn't have been invited to any party. <laughs> But had you, but in your in your family, uh, in the extended family, did you did you see that sort of uh, that that prejudice of, of for 
lighter skin and and you know what, what they call the good hair in in my family mm -hmm. in your extended family oh my extended family mm -hmm. mm, no i couldn't say that mm -hmm. why uh hmm, most of my extended family was was like about my complexion uh, and in san francisco yeah. as well yeah every <laughs> once in a while you have a cousin that you didn't know if that was your cousin or not. It was a little <laughs> mother, and you really didn't care, you know. But uh, no, I didn't. Not not. To, uh, I couldn't. I don't remember any. I didn't call it that. Mm -hmm. Um. And were you in the military? Did I understand you were in the military for a while? Yeah. Like a minute. Air Force, <laughs> Army, and Marines. What? Ooh, no, I'm just I'm just I'm just no, I wasn't in the military. You were not. I was youngest in the family, and, and uh, uh, my brother went. He was in the military. My dad was in the military, but uh, I don't know. If, you know, but well, I was the youngest, so I guess it was a thing then, or something like the youngest child didn't have to go or something. Yeah. Was this during yeah. that? If I was the only child, probably wouldn't have went. Was this during the Vietnam era? Uh, that your brother went in? But he went in and uh, it was probably, probably in the 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, about 70s, somewhere in there. Yeah. I don't think he liked me anyway, so I didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I asked you to put a pin in this uh, um, Hammer song, Bring Our Brothers, Bring Our Brothers Home. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, um, the song was released between 2006 and 2007. And it, it was a military-inspired rap song uh, with a political message to George Bush Yay. about sending American troops back home from war. It was called Bring Our Brothers, uh, Bring Our Brothers Home. Right. And apparently the film, wa uh, the, film wa uh, the video was filmed on the um, Santa Monica Pier. Right. All right. Mm -hmm. And um, what in your mind was the message of that? Uh, the same message that uh, the president was speaking on at the time, bringing the soldier, soldiers home, and Hammond wrote a song about it and said a few words that I don't think the president uh, wanted to hear, because for some reason we stopped doing that song on tour. Yeah, it all of a sudden disappeared and he didn't say anything. What? What can you say about the song? Do you, what, were the, was it the lyrics? Was it? It, it was the lyrics, yeah. Okay. We, we should watch it after this so everybody can see what it was about. Yep. Watching you keep us all safe and out the same mouth. We hate you. I voted for you until this day. I don't regret it. When the phone popped off, you was there in a second. Show them what it is. Talk them cowards a lesson. If they wanna go to war, G double get at them. You did what we needed in our darkest hour. While our peoples was dying in them burning twin towers. Never before had we seen it like this. The enemies we looking for was living in our midst. So we brought it to them and we hit them where it hurts. Stuck their heads in the sand and knocked their dicks in the dirt. They know what it is, sir. Job well done. Now pick up the phone and tell our boys come on home. Bring them home. Bring our brothers home, too much dying, they've been gone too long People crying, that this war is wrong, right or wrong, it's time to come home In a world that's so cold, and nobody knows what this life has in store We can let it go, let it go 
hot And now they got to send it But it ain't what you got It's what you do with it Everybody's watching you to see what it do Politics is politics You better make some moves Living in a glass house You don't throw stones All eyes on y'all Now you're sitting on the throne We listening close Don't sing the same songs In two more years There's more voting going on It's not about you You can hit the door It's about them youngsters Out fighting the war Clean up the game, we done made a mess We done our best, and we passed the test We hit them in the desert, blast them in the cave Tanks through the city and Saddam gon' hang They know what it is, sir, job well done Now pick up the phone and tell our boys come on home Bring them home, bring our brothers home Too much dying, they have been gone too long People crying, that this war is wrong Right or wrong, it's time to come home In a world that's so cold I support you, sir, and we got no beef. I'm just a rapper, you commander in chief. From out of my heart, my mouth do speak. So everything I'm saying, sir, is what I believe. I do believe that the children are our future. So why leave them open where them rats can shoot them? If we leave them there, them suicides gon' do them. Drive past the front line and run right into them. They don't value life, so it ain't no talking to them. They say when they die, a bunch of virgins gon' screw them. Now you tell me, what kind of ish is that? We took them to war, now it's time to fall back. I support you and the war on terror. And I pray for you when you made that error. This is not the enemy, this is from a friend. Bring our boys home and in the end we all win. Bring them home. Bring our brothers home, too much dying They have been gone too long, people crying That this war is wrong, right or wrong It's time to come home In a world that's so cold And nobody knows what this life has in store We can let it go, let it go The world is changing, life is changing But we said that, that uh, you probably didn't sit well with someone, mm -hmm. you know, and being, we're so small in this world, mm -hmm. you know, and you can disappear yeah. if necessary. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, you have to be careful with certain powers um, if, when, you, when you're writing songs or especially musically, you see what's going on with the, with the rappers, you know, because they said something about another rapper mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. so, so imagine seeing something about a president <laughs> that have a lot of fans. See, I was not familiar with the song yeah. uh, until you posted it yeah. uh, for, mem uh, for uh, a mor Memorial Day the other day. Mm -hmm. So I that went, Veterans Day. yeah, oh, sorry, yeah, thank you, Veterans Day. And I went and listened to it, and I, I, I think I heard what the message was that you were talking about. And I thought, oh, this, I wonder what happened with this. And I was thinking, I was thinking about this, about how it was sort of a reminiscent of, of um, Muhammad Ali's talking about uh, soldiers, black soldiers coming uh, and fighting for a nation that was, that was racist towards them. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just, I wonder what that, what, what, I did. It got a lot of it got a lot of attention. Yeah, it was on CNN for about four weeks, four to five weeks. Mm -hmm. it could have been six, mm -hmm. but I was seeing that video, you know, a lot on on CNN. 
and uh, the interview with Hammer on CNN as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's a very political very video. And a lot of it he was saying he was for what he's doing mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I voted for you mm -hmm. and then he started saying some other things that I can't remember right on camera mm -hmm. I'm not much of a rapper, but I just sang the hook. Mm -hmm. Bring him home. So nobody called me. I was just helping. <laughs> <laughs> I was the janitor. <laughs> okay, so helping. What can you tell us about your experience with uh, Hammer? Where do I start? It's a great experience. It's been 31 plus years, maybe 33 years now. Uh, we're very close like brothers, he's closer, we're closer than our own brothers, you know. And um, it, it's been a good experience, and, and, and I've traveled the world with him that long, the last six, five or six world tours. Mm -hmm. um, he's a great person, family man. Uh, the funniest thing is, when I have a baby, he has a baby. <laughs> so, he admired what I was doing. <laughs> so my youngest kid, Who's an artist, Kevon Williams, he has a video on media stuff, what it, at this, at that, what's that, Instagram? Yeah. yeah, he has some stuff on there. But he's my youngest son's godfather. So, uh -huh. and the type of guy he is, I don't care if the, 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 the airline ticket is $2,000, if the little guy asks can he go somewhere, Mike, get him on the flight. <laughs> You know, yeah. he's there. He don't care what it, what it takes, you know. So, and he's like that with his kids, too, you know. Whatever they want, you make it happen. What in... What I read about you is that you are a songwriter and a vocalist and a producer. Can you tell us about your producing? How is that? How does that work for you? It works well. I love it. I'm very creative when it comes to music. I play piano mm -hmm. to write. Mm -hmm. I'm not a just get on the piano, just go. Mm -hmm. But I play enough to write and, and I, I hear what I hear in my mind, I put to the keys and make song out of it um, as a producer and as a writer, as a producer and a writer. And, and I'm an artist, of course. Mm -hmm. um, I forgot the other question, but I'm gonna act like I didn't, so I'm gonna keep going. Mm -hmm. I was starting with Fantasy Records, writing with different artists and doing demos for mm -hmm. the Spinners. And this and is before you met uh, with uh, Right before Hammer. I met Hammer. I was, with, I was 19 when I signed with Fantasy Records. Mm -hmm. Creedence Clearwater, I'm sure you remember that. They built the company. Mm -hmm. That's why the big pretty building mm -hmm. is Creedence, you know? So I was an artist on that label, doing demos for uh, Dramatics and uh, what's it, an R&B group, Lenny Williams and The Spinners and Dorothy Moore. And then I started writing for Dorothy and did some writing um, on some movie soundtracks, you know. And um, uh, so that, that as, as an artist, that's some of the things I've done with before Hammer. Mm -hmm. I started as a drummer in, in the... Uh, late 60s, uh, because James Brown was just my man. Yeah, yeah right. You know? yeah. Yeah. So those grooves, I had them, I tore up a bunch of Sears sets, you know, yeah. Sears and Robux. <laughs> so he had, to, he had to finally spend a thousand dollars to get me a real drum set. Uh -huh. Because you, you just spend a thousand after I tear five up right. from Sears, right? Yeah. So give me the real deal. Mm -hmm. And then I start playing, you know, we started a band in the neighborhood, me and the guys, and nah, 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 nah. First tour to Japan was uh, with uh, Cold Fire. Had a hit out Party Hardy there with Capitol Records at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's where my music started from, San Francisco, early 60s, uh, up until now. Um, do you have a philosophy about music? Today? Yeah. Anything goes. Yeah. <laughs> A raindrop and a melody will, will do it. It's just about the promotion, how much money you put behind it, uh, as far as music. It doesn't take a big production like before. Mm -hmm. I would rather hear the big production. Or not, if, if it's a good song, good melody, you know. Um, but I'm more into, these days, 
more into the big band sound, Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis Jr., that type of stuff, because I had to make room for myself. That's my man. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I can keep I, up with the, the, who's the guy? Chris Brown. Yeah, 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 yeah. Neo. I'm not trying to do all that, man. Turn one hand flips. I'm not going to do it. I, I grew up. <laughs> I, I, grew up uh, I, I told my father that, uh, a little while ago that I grew up um, having headaches on, on Saturday mornings because my father would play Sammy Davis Jr., O.C. Smith. <laughs> You know, all these people, and I woke up with a headache because my I was just listening to this music when I, as I was waking up. And um, B.J. Barnum, do you know that guy, the, the mm. arranger? No. Anyway, so a little while ago I started writing this new musical that was taking place in the 60s, and I remembered all that sound, you know, those those kinds of uh, big band sounds yeah. and the yeah. orchestrations and everything. Um, you know, so uh, I'm wondering about when you write when you write music. Do you hear that the orchestration? Do you have somebody orchestrate it for you? No, I can or, hear. I mm -hmm. can hear every part. You mm -hmm. know, that's what bugs me about some of the bands that mm -hmm. that I performed with before. They don't listen to the song to learn it. They make up stuff that's not in the song, and that that is not the song anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, even the the kick pattern. You know, I hear right. the kick drum. I hear the guitar part and, I, and the little bells on the side that some people don't hear. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a friend like that too that hears everything. And, and so we have discussions that the band don't understand what we're talking about. It works. Yeah, yeah. When you were, um, when you were younger, did you, uh, what, did you decide that the voice was going to be your instrument? And how did that work for you? I didn't want to sing when I was younger. I decided the drums was going to be my instrument. Mm -hmm. I would sing mm -hmm. by myself, uh, but I didn't want anyone to hear me. <laughs> so my first recording, I, it was just drums mm -hmm. and vocals mm -hmm. and the melody. Did was it like a, a sound on sound recorder, like a one of those? No, my mom took me to the studio. Oh. I didn't uh -huh. even want to go there. I think yeah. I recorded at home. <laughs> And yeah. then she took it and had it pressed. Had it pressed. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah. It started out on this this very hard metal type. Mm -hmm. I guess that's the uh, the master that they mm -hmm. make the wax out of. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I, I I just did vocals and and, uh, and drums. If I wasn't under the weather, I would I would because I can still sing that song. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. And it's about a girl. Mm -hmm. I remember that. Well, they're always about girls. <laughs> <laughs> My first song that I ever wrote was about a girl. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's always a, you know my cello is named Enola. That's uh, that's about a girl too. Um, so, do you consider yourself a more of a performer than a composer or songwriter now? Well, or is it all equal? Kind of fifty-fifty because really? I love both. Uh -huh. You know, I, I I like it because it brings smiles to. The audience and the energy that you get back, I love it. You know, and the creativeness of, of um, creating it. Mm -hmm. It's just, um, within itself, it's, it's just, a, a, I don't know, it's something magic about it. I call it, I call it yummy. Yes, it's yeah, tasty. It's yes, yummy. I like, it's I was yummy. thinking, I was trying to think of yeah. a way to say I saw you doing that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, I understood what you were saying. It's yeah. yummy. That's, that's, yeah. that's the good stuff. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's yummy. Yeah, man. So, don't get mad. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> but now let me ask you another question. Um, when you're producing, mm -hmm. you're producing other people. What's that yeah. like for you? Do you? What is your relationship with younger people? That you know, do you find them? Do they come to you? How does that work for you? Well, since I'm not that yeah. young anymore, I don't like younger people. <laughs> that's why I have this place. I don't want to be out there. Up there. They're okay, but that you know the respect thing and, and yeah. cockiness and mm -hmm. you know they'll cuss out a eighty year old. They don't care. Hit them, hit them, whatever. You know. So I, I need. I should have been a police officer. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was the question though? Okay. Yeah, let me get back to it, yeah. Well, let me well, let me combine that question with yeah. an, with another question. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The question was that was a good one. 
when you're doing when you're doing production, you're producing other people. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So, uh, like in uh, particular the younger people, but I, I'll let you just go on and take the whole spectrum of age. But okay. what's it like for you to produce other people? Where do you find them? Do they find you? Do you do you go someplace and say, ah, I want to produce you? This would be a good thing. Well, um, it happens both ways. Because if I know someone, or I'll call and say, hey, what's going on? Or you know anybody looking for tracks? Oh, yeah, the Whispers are looking mm -hmm. for a track. Or friends that play with them say, hey, the Whispers are looking for a song, man, submit something. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I'll go right away if I'm, if it's, you know, if I'm feeling it at the time. I'll go in and write it. That's what happened with the Whisper situation. Mm -hmm. Buddy of mine called me and said, they're looking for a song. I was already in the studio. So drop everything. Let's start a new track. And I, I have an idea for them because I've been listening to their sound so long. Mm -hmm. you know. And, and uh, when I did that, they even called me after they heard it and said, man, how do you sound like us? <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I used to come to the rehearsals with a friend of mine when I was 16, and I, I, I've been to all you guys' rehearsals. I, mean, I don't miss it if I don't, you know, if I'm around. So I take their sound, even Lenny Williams. I'll imitate his voice and, and, um, and write something in that style. Mm -hmm. You know, even the Pointer Sisters. I, I, I did some tracks on them for the movie soundtrack, uh, Night Vision. And um, they, they did that. It's an HBO special now. It still comes on sometime. I don't know why I'm not getting a royalty check. But it comes on. It comes on. Somebody, what, you got to take care of your paperwork, you know? Yeah, and I didn't. Well, yeah. well one, of the things, one of the things I noticed when I listen to samples of your work, mm -hmm. it's really varied. There's a lot of different sounds. You don't have just one particular sound. And I was just wondering if you if you purposefully do that, I mean, are you just talking about being able to match sounds from different people? Is, no. that, is that part of your philosophy then? No, mm -hmm. uh, I get bored. Mm -hmm. That's why I have more than one business. Mm -hmm. You know, because don't laugh, somebody knows me. <laughs> That's why I have more than one mind. I wake up, man, with all these crazy ideas, mm -hmm. and I just pursue it, mm -hmm. because this is my only time here that I know of. So I'm going to make the best of it. I want to touch everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But, um, man, I'll be going off on my own thing. What was the question? <laughs> well, if you have to ask, I'm doing my job OK. You are doing great. <laughs> um, when you are producing other people, that was yeah. that was the question. Okay, right. All right, but it goes into the what your answer goes into the question of what is your process as a musician, your your own process when you sit down to write a piece of music. It it's for me, it's just it's up here, and I have a mind where it's like uh, it's a multi-track recorder. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I I explain that to people where I can hear the music. And I can hear it going forwards and backwards and upside down and upside down and backwards. Right. It's like like just adding all the layers. Um, mm -hmm. And I thought that everybody thought felt that way. I, I remember when I was a little kid, it was like, well, um, people were amazed. You know, I was writing music, and I would say, well, you don't just read; you all you read and write, right? You know, it just sounded sounded really natural to me. But yeah. that that facility that you have. Do you have that in yeah. your mind? It's in my mind, especially if I'm driving. You know, mm -hmm. I do a lot of from here to Sacramento to go home mm -hmm. and I'd be bored and I'd mm -hmm. get tired of talking to myself. Mm -hmm. So I have to come up with some creative things and music ideas, who I want to write for, what they mm -hmm. sound like. And I can hear all the parts, you know. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I'll record it on my phone mm -hmm. And then I'll sing with that through my right. speakers. Right. Because, you know, harmony parts are just. Mm -hmm. Oh, I really like being here. Don't you want to come and go with me? I got that up, 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 you know, yeah, I, I know. know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
just made up something crazy yeah. like I just did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, the technology that's available to us now, oh, I would have killed for that when I was a teenager. <laughs> You're not a teenager anymore? No, not, not, not anymore. <laughs> but I remember but when you I was, still do it. Yeah. I still do it. Yeah. yeah. I remember um, multi-track recorders, multi-track yeah. cassette recorders. My father had one. And then he couldn't understand why he couldn't keep it in his in his room. Yeah. I, yeah. I was <coughs> always oh, taking Even when I didn't know, I used I had two tape players, cassette players, mm -hmm. and I'd sing a part yeah, and yeah, did yeah. it too. I'd sing a part and then yeah. I'll play it yeah. and I'll sing yeah. the other part on this right. one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I did uh, this I did the same thing. My father had that uh, multi track recorder, right? And I had written my first symphony. I was seventeen years old, right? And I would try to say you have to hear it, because I'm not a pianist, right? So I wasn't really going to play it. I, I played one part on the cello, and then recorded another part, which would be the violins, and then I was trying to sing another part, and you know, just like put as many voices together as I possibly could, so I could tell people what this thing sounds like, right? But um, it was never what was, what was up here, right? And so hmm. the technology yeah. that is now available, I would have killed for a, a, a smartphone <laughs> where I can do <laughs> these kinds right. of recordings, right? I thought it was natural for people to hear all the parts. Some of my friends as musicians, that's been musicians for a long time, mm -hmm. you don't hear that part? Yeah. No, I, can't, I can't hear it. Okay, play it again. Yeah. Play yeah. it again. Yeah. You, hear, you heard it that time. It went there, there, there. No, I can't hear that, you know? Mm -hmm. Just like that one song. Tell me if you hear this, because I have a buddy uh, named Vanderland that lives here, mm -hmm. and, and, and we all fall in on this one part. I don't care where I am in the club, we'll do it when we're, when we're up here listening to a little bit of country. Mm -hmm. But it goes, listen to the guitar part. I'm gonna do it. Okay. People say I got a drinking problem. Yeah, right. That ain't no reason to stop. People say I gotta get that, that, down, 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 because I'm living on the right. Have you ever heard that guitar part before? Down, 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 down. Yes. Huh? Yeah. It's not enough people saying yeah. <laughs> you heard that part, that down, down, down. Yes. Yeah. Okay, two people over here. Okay, yeah. that's good, cool. that's cool. But yeah, little parts like that, uh, uh, yeah. Hearing music. Yeah. Um, I don't listen to music. I don't. I don't. <laughs> um, and that, okay. It's because I'm always performing. And I'm so, it's like something that I do. And if I'm listening to, if I'm on the, if I'm in the car, I want to listen to talk radio or something. Yeah. Um, because for me, music is a conversation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's something that if, if, if music is going on anywhere, I pay attention to it. It's like somebody talking to talking to me. Right. For me, it's like that. I was wondering if it, if for you, you have that, like, if I'm intentional, I want to listen to music. I will do that. Yeah. But when you're talking about hearing those sounds, mm -hmm. what is it like for you? For me, it's like that conversation. If you hear music going, is it something that you can turn off, or do you, you just, does it get filtered in? It gets filtered in. I hate turning music off. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have to have music. I get pissed off at the bartenders yeah. when they don't have music on. Yeah. Yeah. Who's in this building with no music on? Yeah. You know? Oh no, I have to have music. I hate to leave the house without music playing. Okay, so I don't like turn it off. Another question. Okay. Um, I often talk to people who say that music is like a soundtrack for their for their for their lives. The, does anyone else feel that way? It's like uh, oh, yeah. you have you, you, you put on a soundtrack, you hear music, and music makes you feel a certain way. I feel good today, or whatever. Um, what what are your what are your travels to and from uh, Sacramento like? Well, it's all music. Uh huh. Or I get in the mood for talk radio. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I get in, in the mood for classical music. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. the only music I don't get in the mood for. It's hip hop. Oh, well, I knew you were that. Say would, that that that'll make you run into somebody. Don't listen. To that. <laughs> no, it makes so you violent. What 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 is it about it? 
that you don't like? The, the, the message. I don't like the message. It's negative. Yeah. It downgrades women. They downgrade each other. Yeah. You know, it's just all negative. Yeah. You know, a lot of it. There's a few good songs. There's a couple of Tupac that's talking about <laughs> mama and whatever. I can deal with that. Hammer songs. That's why a lot of my friends didn't understand in the beginning why I'm going off again. I didn't, why I didn't, um, how, how I got involved with Hammer, you know, because he's a rapper. I even questioned that when, when, when uh, I was in the studio and the guy said, you know, I got to hurry up because I have a session coming in. This guy named Hammer. I said, who is Hammer? You know, the, da the, the rapper that dances. I said, man, I don't listen to no rap, right? So I leave. He's still playing my music, Hammer comes in. He said, who is that on the, on the track? Well, that's the guy that just left. He said, oh man, I like, call him and see if you want to uh, put a group together to do a world tour. <laughs> you know, I, need, I need five singers, I need five guys and five girls. If he can get some guys together, they can come down and audition. So he called me, I said, he's with Confunction, one of the leaders. Oh, oh, he was? Yes, yeah, oh. the leader of Confunction. So he called and said, yeah, the guy, uh, Hammer wanted to know if you want to do the world tour. He, they're looking for some, uh, 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 put a group together for the world tour. I said, man, I don't do no rap. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't even listen to rap, you know. So I said, he said, no, 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 there's some singing part, just the vocals. You know? I said, all right, I'll, I'll check it out. Send me the music and I'll listen to it. And uh, so we went down and got the job in 1991. Wow. And that was history. I'm glad I did it. Rap was, it, it was really interesting. If I'm not mistaken, I would like to know what your thought is about this. Hammer, um, over time, he was considered like one of the pioneers of rap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then over time, he uh, people felt that he sold out. Uh -huh. That that all of a sudden, uh, over time, his music was not punchy enough, or it was too yeah. commercial. Um, and then the 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 rap world sort of diverged off. Um, and Hammer is writing not only rap but also music behind it yeah. and and um what are you thinking about that well uh he has a good like we were talking about the sounds and, and different things in music he has a good ear for that so he's similar to what we were talking about mm -hmm. but what i think about that is i would love to sell out right now because a hundred million dollars sounds good <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I would put yeah. some new bricks yeah. up there. <laughs> <laughs> they would be gold, but I would get some bricks. Some gold bricks. Right. Yeah. Right. But yeah, it was a lot of that back in the day. And he bought helicopters from the police and he did that. He's selling out, he's doing commercials, he's doing movies. Oh, what a sellout. Yeah. But look now, everybody's yeah. doing it, you know? Right. Yeah. Oh, look, you have a hundred dancers on stage. Now everybody have a hundred dancers on stage. Not as many, mm -hmm. but close, you know. So it's been good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, when you look at your career as a musician, mm -hmm. think about what's uh, where you've been. I see that you've got some ideas about where you want to go. You just dropped dropped a song not too long ago called. Um, they don't know. They don't know. The one you mentioned earlier, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, we did a video on that. And we that were... video that you're ta that you're talking about when you and I were talking about this, the how technology has really made our lives as musicians, as yeah. creative people, easier. Can you talk a little bit about that? About how that was produced? Yeah, that was produced by accident. That's it. Mm -hmm. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, that was. Um, Produced because I was uh, in the process of putting a team together to do some filming for a sitcom that I, I've been working on for a while now. Just haven't had time to start shooting, but uh, pretty soon. I was so well, I bought some camera equipment and I wanted to test it out to see the quality of the equipment. So I said, "Well, I'm having I'm stuck on this script, so why don't we just shoot a music video?" So I took this old song from 30 years ago that I wrote and we shot a video just to check the quality of the camera. And um, uh, so that's how that came about. But wait a minute, hold on. So you're being, yeah, there is more. And I think you're being a little bit too modest. I am. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, the film, it, you, you, you shot it in different places around, around the Bay Area. Hometown. Right. Yeah, San Francisco. Right. And what occurred to me when I was watching that is that, gosh, th this place is pretty photogenic. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of places you would appear 29. Yeah. You're overlooking, overlooking 39. A, a 39. 39. We went to another. Yeah, place. it was 39. 39. You're right. Okay. Um, anyway, so, uh, you know, so you went a lot of different places. And, yeah. and I was really impressed with the quality of the, of the film yeah. or of the, the images mm -hmm. because even if you're, it was like accident, it was really good. I yeah. I, I yeah. shot some here in uh, Clear Lake. The jewelry scene. Oh, really? That was Ness. Ness. Oh, right. Ness oh, wow. Yeah. That's yeah. Ness. Yeah. Oh, I said, oh, let me get my buddy in there. I said, hey, can I come in there with you? He said, oh, yeah, sure. I said, you know, huh. you never know where to go, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah, so I did some stuff there. I, I had, uh, uh, the reason why I wanted to do the, the sitcom and whatever, acting is just fun. Mm -hmm. I did a, a, a co star in a movie with Fred Williamson. And we shot a lot of scenes in Clear Lake. Mm -hmm. we, we used the police station and police cars. And it was a <laughs> film called Sugar Race. Sugar Race. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was an HBO thing. What and, year? Uh, uh, wow. There when you did go. That come Who said that? Huh? What year? What, what year was that? <laughs> hmm. Let me think about that. Ballpark. Yeah, ballpark. Yeah. Uh, We'll be doing a lot of Google searching. Oh, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, 12, maybe 2012. Could have been 10. Try 10. Okay. Yeah, it's been a while. Okay. Uh, Clovis saw that I'm standing here to let you know that I'm going to, I could listen to you talk all night, and I'm sure everybody else here could, but we did promise some time for a Q&A. So yes. I wanted to give you time for another couple questions, Clovis, okay. but also to let you know that these people here should start thinking. If you have any questions, some a follow up from something that Andre and Clovis were talking about, or a question of your own. We also want to welcome our Zoom audience and ask if there are any Zoom questions. Those will be relayed to me by our techies over here, by Ami. So I just wanted to say that. So a few more, a couple more questions. Yeah, we were intending to do music today, but it's not going to be possible with. The voice that uh, yeah. it's loosening it up. It's <laughs> it's 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 not it's tonight. Tonight. Some people want to hear a song or two. Yeah. I'm working on. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, so, overall picture, overall uh, question that I have, and this is this is not a political question, but it has some bearing on that. Okay. Um, in this moment where we are. Mm -hmm. where people are politically, racially, in all kinds of ways, in feeling opposite. <coughs> Earlier you said that it's about love, right. music, yes, and this, the role of art. What are you thinking? What do you, what, what do you think about the role of art as a way of healing and um, informing the moment that we're in? Well, uh, I think music is important in that aspect, and we need more songs to, to justify some of the things that are going on and around. And we need more positive songs, more positive music, you know, because it, it brings on positive thoughts. You know, I've, I've experienced that in Clear Lake with some DJs. Mm -hmm. uh, just to give them an example how you can control the room with the music. Mm -hmm. And I do that here all the time, you know, when I see people that look like it might be a problem. Put on the piano music, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. and, and Put on and, classical music. Yeah, cla <laughs> classical anything. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah. excuse, can we do something about the music? I said, no. <laughs> well, the door is right there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, there's a couple other places you can go, you know. I said, 12 go, down, go down the street to drink. Yeah. <laughs> no, at, at 12 o'clock, this is what we play. Yeah, what yeah, play. Yeah. At 12 o'clock, we, we just smooth things out. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So um, I've experienced a lot of, there's a lot of control you can have with music or, or create with music. It's, it's weird. I mean, even when I had the restaurant open, Clear Lake, mm -hmm. guy come rushing in, yeah, man, give me, a, give me an order of chicken wings, yeah. Can't sit still. And then when I hear, when he sit down, he says, yeah, gotta go, gotta go, and hurry, you know? 
He sat down and listened to the sound of uh, who I used to play all every day, James Taylor. Uh. <laughs> and the guitar and stuff yeah. get to him and it's smooth and then uh, excuse me, I I'll just I'll just have I'll it just here. <laughs> yeah. I said, man, look what the music's doing to this guy. So that's what I, I do with these guys up there. I brainwash them with the music. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, yeah, put on some nice jazz or whatever. DJ was playing this stuff, you know, playing. He said, man, can we change the music? I said, no, it looked like some rough guys over there. I said, let me show you something, how to control them. Put on Too Short. Very negative sometimes. <laughs> Very negative, terrible. Yeah. And at first it was calm, listening to Earth, Wind, and Fire, playing pool, enjoying the night. As soon as he put that on, they start raising the stick in the air. Yeah! yeah. yeah. I said, see? How hyper they get now? <laughs> Now change it, you know? Uh, man, so yeah, yeah, so what were we, sir? We were talking about the arts. <laughs> the arts, yeah. So the role of art yeah. and healing. Um, yeah, healing. Music is very healing. Right. Right. Very good for the soul. That's why I can't turn it off, you know? Um, you ready for I, Yeah, I'm, I'm ready to relinquish this um, Well, you don't have time. to relinquish the stage. No, but I... I'm, Let's ask some questions. I'm going to ask people, people if you have a question to raise your hand, I'll bring you the microphone because we are recording this for people who couldn't be here. I didn't know that. Just like we recorded <laughs> Clovis's conversation last June, a year and a half ago, June, June 10th. Um, and it's available on the uh, Middletown Arts Center website if you want to listen to some of Clovis's other stories and hear him play Chato. I want to start with the first question, Andre, which might not be fair. You said your voice was loosening up a little bit and you might be ready to sing. Yeah. What would you sing if you were going to sing? Whatever you want me to sing. Well, we, we want to know what's moving you. Frank Sinatra. <laughs> Mr. Saturday Dance Heard they crowded the floor Couldn't bear it without you Don't get around much anymore Thought I'd visit the club da, za, 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 Got as far as the door they all ask me about you Don't get around much anymore yeah. Ready? Put some Louis. Nice. Down in my hands <laughs> My mind is more at ease It's a bad decision, Coco Bobo Thank you. I had one question to get us started, and then I'm hoping to hear from other people. You talked about that moment where the song you did with Hammer was shut down. Yes. Um, bring about Bring Our Boys Home. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, you said you, it, it just went away, and nobody talked about it. He didn't talk about it. He didn't talk about yeah, it. Yeah, no one else really knew what was going on. No one ever, the other, they were just dancers. You know, they're young, they don't care. Well, <laughs> I'm curious though. I am curious about what it felt like to you as an artist who was part of the making that art, as a man who knew about people who went to war, wanted them to come back, as a self-identified brown man. What did it feel like you to you to have that song disappear? become invisible, like you said earlier. Well, uh, I, I didn't question it much myself. I just felt something went on that he didn't want to talk about. Mm. You know, uh, sometimes it's best to just, shh, just let it fade out. Because there's, I mean, we're still on tour. We're still working. So it's not like the song stopped anything, you know. But it did, it did stop a message that he was putting out there that someone didn't like. There's no way we would just stop that song abruptly like that. You know, it was a great song and, and people, they need to hear that. A lot of soldier families and, and people, military people, that really appreciate the song, even today. You know, you get a lot of hits, probably over a million now on YouTube. Or Listen something. to it if you can. Yeah, yeah. Because as Clovis said, music is a conversation mm -hmm. for 
artists like you, it's not for me. I'm one of those people who listens to a talk show on the radio and talks to the talk show. So <laughs> that's my conversation. But it means you started, you tried to start a conversation with the music and it got shut down. Yes, well you started a conversation with the wrong person. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think yeah. sometimes, yeah, sometimes you just have to back up, you know. Yeah. Even, even here, I mean, I, sometimes I back up. A lot of times I don't. <laughs> Good. Anybody got any questions for Cody? Yeah, good. Let me bring you a microphone so they can hear you better. Hi. How are you, Mr. Williams? Hi. I have one question. <laughs> After listening to you, you're from San Francisco, yes. which is my old playground where I was. Um, why Lake County? How did we end up here? <laughs> I mean, truly, how did we end up here? Both you and she want to know. <laughs> How did she and you both end up here? Well, just like we end up anywhere else, our parents who decide this is a better place than another place, and I just happened to love it once I got up here, you know. Now I can't leave. I mean, I leave, but you know what I mean? I come back like a rubber band. But you had that one experience here that you mentioned earlier and it was dealing with race, I don't know why, because like you, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. You're in school, those are your friends, everybody's your friend. Yeah. So you had this unpleasant experience up here, but you opened businesses here, Mr. Williams, mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering what made you do that? Well, it's back to the parents again. Those kids in the truck didn't have good parents as far as I'm concerned. There you go. Because you need to teach everybody to love. If I, my all, both of my sons, my daughters, everybody know that I don't play that game. So they never, they never even thought about it. It was never even a thought. My my daughter knows more country songs than they have written. <laughs> yeah, she so she goes. To, she goes every country concert. You know, every all her friends, her sisters are white. Her. You know, I have white daughters, I have new daughters. Yeah, I just love everybody, you know? And, well, thank you for bringing yeah. love to Lake County. Yeah, of course. Yeah, hold on, I'm gonna just hand this to you. First of all, Andre, I wanna thank you for uh, opening this place and uh, for, yes. um, for, for bringing the breadth of culture to our community, both uh, with the drinks where the young folks that you try to stay away from a little bit, uh, have found to uh, end up and, and bring in a place uh, here for uh, those of us who have been around a little longer. Um, and uh, I have a question about your uh, performance. Uh, and I have told people about this. Uh, during the middle of a number, a couple of times I've seen you do this, where you pick out a woman in the, in the audience and, um, and you give them a dead microphone. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you ask them to sing, and um, the the, uh, it, the 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 breadth of your range that that reflects. But how did you learn to do such great ventriloquism? Uh, um, <laughs> tell me, tell me about how that came about for you to 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 do that uh, that bit in your in your shows? Well, it's just uh, a part of a show. That's that's what entertainment should be. They say show business, you know, the business, and this is the show part of it, where you create funny or uh, involvement with your audience. And that's where I came up with that at. And, and as far as changing voices and doing things, my sisters, my brothers and sisters I used to sing with growing up, so I get a lot of, I don't know if you remember the thumping the head. Oh, yeah. Be a thing. yeah, if you sing a wrong note, that's why, you know, harmonies and stuff. You're not, you're singing the wrong, okay, okay. And they're much older than I am. But I would, me and uh, one particular sister, we we used to imitate a lot of people. Miss McGillicuddy, I just remember the name. I don't remember what show that was from. <laughs> oh, Mrs. McGillicuddy, you know. <laughs> Miss Doubtfire, you know, people like that, you know. Oh, Mrs. Doubtfire, who are the, the kids? Oh, oh, who the, you know. So we, we did a lot of clowning around and, and, and you learn voices or whatever. I don't know where I got the range from, maybe from my grandmother or something. 
because I hear she was a singer and used to sing to me a lot as a baby. But I don't remember that, but uh, I guess it did something. It took some type of effect. We've got, we've got a couple questions from our Zoom audience that I'm going to ask Thomas to read for Ooh, me. Somebody's and, really watching this. Yeah, they're really watching it. <laughs> yeah, they do. You got fans out there. We have a comment from David Becerra. Any tips on balancing music, business, and family life? <laughs> Don't try it. <laughs> Don't try it. <laughs> no, there, there is a, 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 let's see here, any tips on balancing? Hmm. I would say take care of home first and, and or pretend to, however you want to do it, but just make sure your wife is happy, one thing, for sure. And, and uh, she, it would be her idea to, well, why don't you go do a little music? To, uh, pout a lot, just pout. That's what I do. I sit around and, and she said, well, maybe you should go do some music. I said, yeah, maybe so. So the secret there is happy, happy wife, happy life. Yeah, just keep her happy. She'll, she'll decide you should go practice or something. Get to okay, sit around crying. The next question is from Kathy Walton. She would like to comment on the conversation about black on black racism. Mm. Wow. Come on, lady. The reason of colorism within the black community. The reason? Reason. <laughs> yeah, that's what she asked. <laughs> well, it could have something to do with, first of all, drugs and alcohol in the black community being overloaded and, and overstimulated. Uh, maybe that has something to do, because alcohol and drugs can make you pretty crazy, pretty loopy. So I, I don't know, it might have something to do with, with, with that. I think, I, if I'll answer that. Yeah, please do, because I'm thinking uh, something else now. I'll, my brother says that human beings discriminated against each other for the craziest reasons. Yeah. And he says that even if all of us were exactly the same mocha colored, we would be discriminating against people because their eyes are different colors or because their feet are different sizes. It just simply is one of the things that uh, we, we human beings do. And then when you combine that with the fact that we live in a very racist society, it's not hard to see how that works, especially also considering that, that um, there were privileges uh, during slavery that were, were there for people who were lighter yeah. Yeah. and had, quote, finer, finer hair and so on. Uh, if they looked more white, they got more privileges. Mm -hmm. So that's how that came to be. But she was speaking of black on black, right? Correct. Right. right. Yes. Okay. Right. Yeah. So it's around the board. I understand what you're saying around the board. But there's a, a bit of brainwash there um, that it worked, but uh, it's there. It sounds like you have another thought too. <coughs> I have several thoughts. <laughs> Are you willing to share them with us? Not at this time. Okay. <laughs> I, I wish this would turn into a song right now. <laughs> oh, it might. Yeah. But go ahead, you have another question? Yeah. Yeah, I got another question right up front. Yeah, it's more of a comment. Uh, I've seen you guys perform many times, being a photographer and videographer in this county for many years. And I've really enjoyed, you know, shooting you. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, I'd say, and uh, um, in your performances, Andre, uh, where I've captured you is that Soper Reese, and uh, and the thing that I think is really marvelous in your performance, and I heard you say the word. I was waiting for you to say the word entertainment, and you finally said it. And because to me, that is what you really—you're a good musician, creative, and all that—but your connection with the audience, yes. the entertainment, getting the lady up there to sing with you, but you got them up there dancing, you get off the stage, mix with the crowd, singing, um, you make 
us feel a part of the whole musical experience mm -hmm. that you present. And I really want to compliment you on that. Thank you. Because I know that that is out of love. And connecting to what you're hearing tonight from you yeah. saying about how the first thing that came out of your mouth, people being together, love. All right. That's the first thing that came out. And the way you express that on the stage and your audience is really uh, magnificent. And uh, I hope a lot of people get to see that, mm -hmm. you know, because you are very much an entertainer. Thank and, you. Uh, and it's been a joy watching you. And I'm not done. <laughs> <laughs> There's this other player here. Minute. I just know that I know I enjoy how you, I think you should get a strap around <laughs> and pull that baby up there and play I that, like but, a guitar. You know, but, but you too are also the same way oh. in that you try to get people and you communicate to the, to the audience. It's not up there, you just play music mm. and do your thing. That then, No, you, you both are connected to you know the, the audience, and then you all make an effort to do that, and I think that's fantastic. It makes me want to come back and watch it. And thank you for your photographs. <laughs> yeah, so there's a real connection with between community music and communications. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I feel like I'm in the way. <laughs> okay. So Andre, question for you. Fill in fill in the blanks. The thing I am most excited about in my life right now is music and people. Wow. Can you elaborate? <laughs> well, we have music and we need to uh, write positive songs to deliver to the people to keep them good. You know, to, to show the, put the love in the music, and, and it, it, it can be so rewarding uh, as a listener to hear things that make you feel good. That's right. You know, some music don't make you feel good. It's just mm -hmm. music, yeah. you know, or bad music. They said there's two kinds of music is what? There's only two kinds of music? What is it? Good music. Yeah, good and bad. They say country and western. I, <laughs> I say good and bad. You know, well, it's so good or it's bad. It's all music, you know. I just try not to listen to the bad stuff. But yeah, we have to spread love through music. That's what I'm, I'm trying to do. That's what uh, you know. Most of the people that I work with try to do is get the message across to bring the, everyone together. That's what it's all about. Doesn't matter, white, black, whatever. I know what we're talking about today, but I just love people. I'm lucky my grandson is white and black. <laughs> and that feels lucky for you. And that's going to make a better world. Once everybody's black and white, then we're we in there. We won't be here then, but I'm just saying, you know. Yeah. We have some overflow crowd in the back. I just want to look back there and see if anyone had a question for Andre and Clovis. Hold on. Well, first of all, I just want to thank you both for a super interesting conversation. Um, and I want to commiserate a little bit with Clovis mm -hmm. about not listening to music. Yeah. I don't make a habit of that. I mm -hmm. would much rather perform. Mm -hmm. I'm with you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, and I, I'm more with Andre, but I don't perform. Is I it, have to have music on. Is it... Um, is it time for public confession? <laughs> <laughs> always, always time for public confession. Right. Well, I can, I can tell you. Um, uh, remember earlier I was talking about how my brain works, where I hear music all the time. Um, I perform all the time. I'm constantly behind my cello. I spend a lot of time doing music, so a lot of times music is my work. Um, but even if that wasn't true, the thing is, is that music is for me a language. And when I hear music, I see the score. When I was 13 years old and I just started playing music, there was this song called The Poseidon Adventure. Oh, yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah. Here's got to be a morning after, right? Yeah. I thought that was the most beautiful music ever composed <laughs> in the entire world. So guess what I did? 
I got the recording and I dropped the needle and I wrote it out. Every part, every note, every instrument. And I was able to do that. So for me, when I hear music, I see everything. It's a physiological thing for me. And so it is work. And, when, and I can do the other thing. If I see music that I've never heard before, I see a score and I hear it. So it's just that it's kind of like, okay, I pay for it <laughs> this way. Music for me is is uh, like somebody talking to me, or I can't I can't ignore music. There's there's something innate in you then, and both of you. You talked about your responses to music that essentially you seem to have been born with, and that opened up something inside of you. As long as you're doing public confession, Clovis, <laughs> can I ask you about the connection between music and your spiritual calling? Because you've recently become a uh, Unitarian minister. Yeah, minister. Um, yeah, um, music is, um, music is the language of God. It is the language of the divine. It is the language of the universe. And music is something that I take very seriously um, because as Andre said, it is a way that we, uh, it's sacred. And it's something that that um, I have it as, as an integral part of my ministry. And I can honestly tell you, I did not see that at first. Everyone saw that before I did. In, in you? In me, yeah. yeah. So now I embrace the complete. So you say music is God, music is sacred, and Andre tells us music is love, that seems to be a kind of a complete circle. Oh, so we have a lot in common. Yeah. <laughs> but but he's, he's great. He, he, I don't read music. A lot of people say, well, how can you write music if you don't read it? Because I, I hear it and I feel it, but I don't read it. Like you were saying, you um, you see the score. You know, so that that's, that's I, I probably would see the score if I was a reader. Right. But me and Stevie wonder, we don't read no yeah. music. <laughs> So you get to listen to it. <laughs> Do you think that might be, both of you from your orientations, what drew you to the music? I know Clovis electronic music is an important part of your composition, and classical music is your training. Yeah. Do you think there's some connection, and, and Andre, you talked about R&B and the big band music, the, the Frank Sinatras, the Sammy Davis mm -hmm. Juniors. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like the way you experience music may be part of what attracts you to that kind of music? Um, I don't know. Uh, you know, I was taken out of a nightclub in Oakland <coughs> by some original ink spots. <laughs> That that um, wanted that was looking for a tenor singer. Take your no, it's just that they're not here. They're here with you. Yeah. They're no longer here. Mm -hmm. I can answer that question for myself. Oh, yeah, but I'm saying they, they taught me so much about exactly what we're talking about. Yeah, anyway, they pulled me out of the club and taught me about the big band stuff. Um, Patrick Bess and Jim uh, Gordon. Pat was the writer of uh, Sentimental Reasons. 
and uh, that's how he made his living. And a lot of other hits that he did. Lucky Logger, stuff I wasn't even born and never heard of. But they taught me those songs in, in about the big band era. And that's why I have so much love for it. I had never did it before. They hired me to do Vegas and Laughlin and Tahoe and Reno and, you know, we were there, yeah, we were there weeks at a time doing that big band stuff. And, um, you know, I just ex appreciate that experience and being able to work with some legendary guys like that, you know? And uh, I'm sure both of them have passed on. Uh, I, I've tried to get in touch over the years, but, you know, um, no luck there. But anyway, uh, somehow we got on the big band subject. Well, it's wonderful, though. You just connected us to them. Thank you. Thank you both so much for sharing your stories, for being vulnerable with us. We really appreciate it. Kobe, Lewis. Conclusion, um, uh, Andre. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for. Uh, you know, I told you that we're going to open some stuff up, <laughs> and we did. And yeah. this is the. Uh, I am honored, and very, very um, humbled by these experiences. Uh, I want to thank you and all of the people who shared with me their stories in this Sounds of Liberation series. This is the last of it, and um, I think we need to do it a little bit more. Yes. So, thank you very much for all of you. Hey, Marie, set up that video for me so they can watch that video. Oh, okay, there's going to be an, a post-show party here, <laughs> looking at the video that Andre was talking about. On behalf of the Middletown Arts Center, I want to thank you all for being here. We loved being at Andre's Lounge. I, I look forward to coming here and just drinking next time. Um, we, are, we are a very small nonprofit arts organization. All donations are appreciated. If you made a donation when you bought your ticket, thank you so much. Um, we are able to take some donations by credit card, or, you know, if you're, if you're so inclined, it will go to continue to support Sounds of Liberation. Clovis is writing a musical that we hope to work with him to produce at Soper Reese Theater sometime in the next year or so. So, uh, any donation you give tonight will go towards that. If you have any questions for Clovis, he's here for a while. Andre, your bar's open, right? Yeah. I'll be here all night. <laughs> Me and a friend, yeah, the way I feel now, I guess I'll be with you till the end. Yes, I'm on my way, mighty glad to stay, mighty glad to stay. Give yourself a round of applause for taking it. Yes, I'm on my way So hard to see That a woman like you Can wait around for a man like me Yes, I'm on my way Mighty glad to stay Mighty glad to stay I 
this is time for me to come on home. Yes, I'm on my way. I needed a friend. Yeah, the way I feel now, I guess I'll be with you too. Yes, I'm on my way. Mighty glad to stay. Mighty glad to stay. Men, something right now. I have my reasons. I'm not going to say why. But in your older age, do you find yourself getting more emotional? <laughs> oh, so we're like, oh, come Love on. Love movies. Love yes. movies. Man. Love movies. Yeah. yeah. No? Yes. More emotional? Yes. Okay, so it's normal. <laughs> they don't want to know Huh? They said men don't cry. Oh, oh that's a bunch of baloney. Yes. That's yes. what I thought. Man, I get emotional about everything. <laughs> My son, when he comes to the concert with us, he, he sings background now on tour with us. And if he gets any little singing part, you know, sometimes the hammer call him out on the spot. I get emotional. <laughs> This kid, he makes me cry. What do you, what do you have? You have another song? Don't do still. I'll, I'll, I'll start crying. Don't do that. I can't do it. Let's do something that means something like that. Uh, look at that song. Uh, we'll do one more. Uh, Love's in need of love today, because that's what we're talking about. Stevie Wonder. You know that? Oh, yeah. Anybody familiar with this song? Oh, yeah. Good morning, evening, friends. Here's your friendly announcer. I've serious news to pass on to everybody. You find it? That's it. What I'm about to say could mean the world disaster. Could change your joy and laughter to tears and pain. Is that love's in me? Of love today. Don't delay, send yours in right away. Hey, hey, keep that on me. Going round, breaking many hearts. Stop it, please, before it's gone too far. Have you ever heard that? Because he can't get his computer going. Yeah. Give it to him while I can. I don't know, what else do you have over there? Is that that album that is on? Okay, last one. One more thing. Don't go changing. <laughs> Try and please me. You never let me down before. Mm -hmm. I don't imagine you're too familiar. Cause I don't see you anymore. Take 